The producer consumer pattern is a workload distribution pattern where the number of work executing threads is decoupled from the number of tasks these worker threads are to execute. I will cover the theory of the producer consumer pattern first and then I will show you a code example at the end of this video. The producer consumer pattern typically consists of one or more threads that detect what work is to be executed and one or more threads that execute the work. The detected work is typically enqueued as tasks objects inside of a queue and the worker threads can then take these task objects from the queue one by one and execute them. As an example, imagine a situation where a work detecting thread is scanning a directory in the local file system for files to process. For instance, it could be images that have been uploaded to a server. Now imagine too that the server this is running on here has multiple CPUs and so if you simply process the files one by one uh, directly inside of the work detecting thread, then you are not actually taking advantage of the many CPUs sitting in this server. Instead, you would like to have multiple threads um, contribute to the processing of the files. However, if you simply started one thread per file, you would be starting way too many threads for what is efficient to execute on the server. Imagine the server has four CPUs or eight CPUs and you have 1000 files to process. If you start up 1000 files immediately, well, all of these 1000 threads cannot run on these four or eight CPUs at the same time. And also each thread takes up some system resources such as memory. And that means that if you start up 1000 threads at the same time, you will be using a lot of unnecessary system resources for these threads. So, um, and this, these resources such as memory is then not available for uh, use during the processing of the files because it's spent just on the threads themselves. So instead the work detecting thread here can uh, create one task object per image file and enqueue it in a file and then you can have one or more worker threads here taking these task objects out of the queue and executing them one by one. This way you can set the number of worker threads here to match the number of CPUs you have in the server. That way you get a better utilization of the CPUs in the server, in the computer that this is running on. And at the same time, you avoid overloading the server with unnecessary threads that cannot be executed at the same time anyways. And when I say at the same time, I mean at the exact same time, meaning in parallel. Of course, a CPU is able to make progress um, on the work of multiple threads seemingly at the same time by splitting its CPU time between the multiple threads. Um, however, if you want to utilize the CPUs to the max, it's better to have just one thread executing on each CPU. And so by um, matching the number of worker threads here to the number of CPUs, you, you get that more efficient utilization. There are several situations in which you can benefit from using the producer-consumer pattern. A couple of common use cases are to reduce foreground thread latency, to load balance between worker threads, or for back pressure management, and I will explain each of these in a bit. Imagine you have a desktop application with a graphical user interface. Many such graphical user interface toolkits use a single thread which updates the user interface. That single thread also responds to events from the user. So basically that means if the user presses a button, then that button click is handled by the UI thread. And if the UI needs to be graphically updated as a response to that click, then that is also the UI thread that takes care of that. Now imagine 
that the user needs to um, process a huge file. Now, if you process that file directly um, from the UI thread, then while the UI thread is busy executing or processing the file, so executing the task that consists of processing the file, while the UI thread is busy doing that, it cannot update the user interface and it also cannot respond to other requests from the user. So for the user, this means that the UI will appear as if it is hanging, it becomes unresponsive. Instead, it is better for the UI thread simply to detect the work and um, create an object that represents this work, the file that needs to be processed, put it into a work queue, and then have a background thread, a worker thread, execute that work in the background. Once the worker thread then has finished, it can respond with a message back to the UI that the work has finished. So the UI can be updated and tell the user, okay, now this large file that you requested processed, it has now finished. This way, the UI keeps being responsive because the UI thread is still uh, available and free to respond to user interface um, or requests in the user interface from the user. Now in this particular case, I refer to latency as meaning the time from the user clicks the button and selects the file and asks the desktop application to process the file until the UI becomes responsive again, not until the file has actually been fully processed. So the latency between telling the desktop application, the UI here to process the file and the time the UI is able to take the next command from the user. By offloading big tasks from the UI thread to background worker threads, this latency can be drastically reduced and the UI will appear much more responsive to the end user. Another common example of reducing foreground thread latency is inside of a multi-threaded server. Imagine you have a single thread here accepting incoming connections from remote clients. Now, instead of immediately processing the data that comes in from these connections, the connection accepting thread here will simply enqueue the connection and have background processing threads here, background threads, process the data that is coming in from the connections. Now, if the foreground thread here, the accepting thread here, did not um, pass the connections onto background threads, then that thread here would have to process the data from each connection, and that would make the server much less responsive because while the connection accepting thread here is processing data from the first connection, it is not able to accept other incoming connections from other clients. And it is also not able to process uh, data coming in from other already open connections from other clients by um, by instead offloading the connection processing to background threads then the um, connection accepting thread here can immediately uh, go back to a accepting new incoming connections additionally the you can have multiple connection processing threads here you can have just as many as you think makes sense for your application and that means that the server as a whole can process data from many in incoming connections at the same time, depending, of course, on um, the number of CPUs in the server and also what kind of work uh, is required to process the incoming data. For instance, whether these threads here need to also call an external database or other external systems or access the file system or whatever. So that is another common example of reducing the foreground thread uh, latency. Um, and by latency is meant the time from an incoming connection is accepted and until the foreground thread here is able to accept the next connection. The use case of load balancing between worker threads is what I have already explained to you in the first example with a um, thread that scans a directory for image files. Uh, 
and you also have um, load balancing between worker threads in this example here where the incoming connections are uh, load balanced off to multiple worker threads here. In fact, the ability to load balance between worker threads is built directly into the producer-consumer pattern. So even if that is not the main reason why in your specific case you are using the producer-consumer pattern, you still get the ability to load balance between the worker threads for free. You can also use the producer-consumer pattern to implement some level of back pressure management. And by back pressure, I mean that in case the system from the front here is putting too much pressure on the worker threads here in the back, then what happens is this queue here will fill up and eventually, um, on, depending on what type of queue you're using, eventually the queue will be full saying, okay, we can only have 1000 connect incoming connections queued up. We, we don't have space for anymore. Then once that happens, you start having back pressure that goes from the back of the system here towards the front of the system here. Now the uh, connection accepting threat knows, well, the back part of the system here does not have any more uh, capacity to process the incoming threats here. So maybe I should stop accepting incoming connections for a while at least until the queue empties a little bit and there's space again for new incoming connections. So in a way you can say that the uh, front, the foreground thread here, the connection accepting thread here is putting pressure on the background threads here. And when the background threads cannot keep up with that pressure, then the pressure builds up inside of the queue and results in back pressure that goes back from the back of the system here towards the front of the system. So they're pressing back and saying, hey, we cannot keep up, slow down up here in the front. So that is what back pressure management is. And depending on how you implement the queue here and the behavior in the connection accepting threat, you can use this producer consumer pattern to implement some level of um, back pressure management. Um, for instance, if this was a blocking queue, then the connection accepting threat would simply be simply be blocked at the time it is trying to insert a new connection into the queue and the queue is full. All right, so that's a very simple way of blocking the, the foreground thread here from doing more work, the connection accepting thread, simply by using a blocking queue. You could also implement back pressure management without using a blocking queue. In that case, the connection accepting thread here would have to check if the queue is full before trying to insert a new um, incoming connection and in case the um, the queue is full then the connection accepting thread should stop accept accepting incoming connections for a while and maybe do something else here and wait until the queue here empties out a little bit then it can um, insert the connections it has already accepted and then go back to accepting new incoming connections but this is a little bit more work to implement than simply using a blocking queue, but you can then uh, implement more advanced behavior in case your situation requires that. Let's have a look at a simple code example showing how to implement the producer-consumer pattern in practice. This example first creates a blocking queue, and that is the queue which the producer will insert the task objects in and from which the two consumers here will take the task objects. And then the example creates one producer and two consumers. Both the producer and consumer classes here implement the, uh, implement the runnable interface so they can be executed by a thread. Then, as you can see, the producer is given to a thread uh, consumer 1 and consumer 2 are also passed in the constructor to each their own thread and then all of these threads are started. That will in practice start the producer which will then start producing objects and inserting them into the blocking queue and start the consumer 1 and consumer 2 which will then take the queue, the objects from the queue, the task objects from the queue as they become available. Now let's have a look at the producer class here. As 
you can see, and as I told you, the producer implements the runnable interface, which means it needs a run method. And that is the run method that is executed by the thread. And you can also see that the blocking queue is passed as a parameter to the constructor here. And that is what we also saw here. And that is necessary for the producer to be able to insert objects into the queue. It needs a reference to it and it gets it this way. Then, as you can see, the runnable method or the runnable run method here um, keeps iterating in this while loop, so it, it keeps running forever. And in, in a real application, you probably wouldn't do that, but it's just doing that for the sake of this example here. And then, as you can see, it obtains the current time in milliseconds and then puts that uh, time as a string, it concatenates it with the empty string here, which basically means that the empty string here has this time here converted to a string and then concatenated with this text here. So it's a, it's another way of turning the time in milliseconds into a string. And then that string uh, representation of the time in milliseconds is put onto the blocking queue or into the blocking queue. So um, after that, the... Um, the thread here will sleep uh, 1000 milliseconds and um, and that's it. Now let's have a look at the consumer, right? So the consumer also implements the runnable interface. Um, as you can see, the consumer also gets the blocking queue as a parameter to its constructor, uh, as is happening on this line, and then it also has a run method here, which is, of course, necessary when implementing the runnable interface. And as you can see, this class here is also just um, repeating this while loop forever, which you would probably also not do in a real application, but it's just done like this for the sake of this example here. And as you can see, um, the consumer here tries to take an element from the blocking queue. Then it creates a new uh, string, which consists of the the name of the thread that is currently executing this runnable, uh, concatenated with the text consumed and the value of the elements, which is the time in milliseconds that this element was inserted into the queue, right? And then it prints this text out. Now let's try to run this example and see what happens. Now, as you can see here from the output, the two consumer threads here are getting uh, objects and they are getting an object around every second. And that is because the producer thread is sleeping uh, one second before inserting the next element into the queue. And as you can see, thread one and thread two, the two consumer threads, they take turns taking an element out of, of the queue and printing the value out here too. The console. So this is as we expected, since there are two consumer threads, and there is um, not enough, uh, or there are not that many objects inserted into the queue. Well, then they take turns getting an element from the queue, right? And so that's why you see this alternation here. Now, in a in an application where you would have a lot more elements inserted into the blocking queue so that maybe the uh, a number of elements in the queue would build up. You would not have a guarantee that uh, each of the threads here would perfectly alternate between getting um, be get, between getting an, an object. You could easily run into a situation where thread one gets three very easy tasks, which are executed very fast, and thread two gets one longer task, which takes longer to execute, so that thread one would then get um, three tasks in a row and thread two only one in that same time. So, but as you can see in this case here, they alternate pretty much perfectly. That's all for this video about the producer consumer pattern. Remember to check out the description below this video for a link to a textual version of this tutorial as well as other related tutorials. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to my channel.